Uh, greetings to you all. Today's teaching comes out of um, is a continuation of our teaching coming out of Hebrews chapter two, titled "The Original Sin and Salvation: The Plan and Program of Salvation." And now today we are in in um, chapter two, um, verse ten, and um, it reads. Um, God is the one who made men all things, who made all things, um, and all things are for his glory, through whom and for whom all things exist. He wanted to have many children, share his, um, yet yeah, to lead them, bring them uh, into, into glory. So uh, it was fitting appropriate that he made the one who leads them, the leader, the pioneer, the author, the originator, um, to, to lead people to salvation perfect through suffering. Uh, in uh, <clears throat> taking again uh, Hebrews chapter 2 verse uh, 10 from the easy to read version, it reads, God the one who made all things and for whose glory all things exist wanted many people to be his children and share his glory. So he did what he needed to do. He made perfect the one who leads those people to salvation. He made Jesus, Yeshaya, a perfect savior through his suffering. Um, so here what we have is, uh, is um, as in the divine councils, all things were subjected to men. Uh, we saw this in the original, uh, in previous um, verses where um, everything was given, was subjected to that creation was subjected to man, man lost it all, and Yeshaya came to to save man and, uh, and from sin and from damnation. Um, so it is said that uh, God had brought, uh, wanted, brought many sons to glory uh, when the Savior suffered and died for them, to bring um, for them to to bring them these many sons to share in his glory. The new thought here is introduced and uh, it is sharing um, his glory with many children. And that is uh, the divine purpose. Um, yeah, the divine purpose to that Yeshaya should come with uh, many children. So in Hebrews 1.14 it says, all the angels, spirits, all the angels are spirits who serve God and the ministering spirits, and are sent to help those who will receive salvation, that is, men. So unto glory, the glory already spoken to as reserved for men through his Son, uh, who has himself received the glory, that he may make it theirs as well. Hebrews 9.28 reads, So Christ was offered as a sacrifice one time to take away bear all the sins of many people, and uh, he will come, appear a second time, not to offer himself for sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. In Ephesians 2.8 it reads, Yes, it is. Uh, through Christ we all have the right to become, have free access to the Father um, in one spirit. Ephesians 3.12 reads, In Christ we can... We can become before God, we can come before God with freedom, boldness, uh, freedom of speech, and without fear, and we're very confident we can do this through faith in Christ or because of Christ's faithfulness. He showed and led them the way wherein they were to reach him, and he is the way to the eternal Father. Uh, in Hebrews 2.10, um, we, may, we want to emphasize that he wanted to have many children share his glory and, um, and he made the one who leads the people um, to salvation perfect through suffering um, so for whom as the ultimate end uh, is salvation um, and we know that he is the first cause, God the Father. 
in all things in bringing many um, <clears throat> as the first cause are all things um, in bringing many sons into glory, namely believers called God's children. John 1.12 reads, But to all who did ex- accept, receive him and believe in him, uh, in his name, uh, a name indicating the character of the person, he gave the right to become uh, children of God. Romans 8.14 reads, For all those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. 1 Peter 3.18 reads, Christ himself suffered for sins once, and for all, only his suffering has the power to redeem others. He was not guilty, but he suffered for those who were guilty. Uh, the righteous, uh, the righteous for the unrighteous, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. His body was killed; he was put to death in the flesh body, but he was made alive in the spirit, um, or spirits. At his resurrection in a glorified body. Um, so the God for whom are all things um, wishes to bring many sons to glory, not just one, uh, the Lord uh, Jesus, Yeshaya, he who could do all things, whose, whose are all things, worked out his purpose of having many glorious sons through giving them an author of salvation, which is Yeshaya, who was a, who was perfected through suffering. That salvation has to be uh, authored for each for each son makes it personal, and the relationship between the author and the authors the more intimate. So here we are talking about a personal journey to 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 the to salvation through Jesus Christ. It's a personal relationship that is the passage with him. He, he walks you uh, into salvation. The fourth idea that each person uh, has an inherent immortal soul, uh, soul is, to, is totally wrong. It's a false idea. Um, and it destroys uh, the wonder of eternal salvation being personally authored for each one of us. We Immortality was lost when we sinned, so we no longer have an immortal soul. We we get there through Jesus, through His righteousness, um, through Him uh, the sacrifice. We now have eternal life once again. So, <clears throat> so He made uh, Jesus uh, the captain of our salvation. He is uh, the prince, the leader, the author. Um, the author of their salvation is a perfect uh, sacrifice that is a complete saviour through suffering endured for them uh, this suffering to save us and the Lord Jesus who is represented as the leader or commander of the army of the redeemed the sacramental the host of God sacrificial lamb of God but by which suffering he was consecrated to his office, office of salvation, uh, redeemer, redemption, and qualified to discharge, uh, and discharged it, and obtained for us, and obtained that, and we obtained that salvation through uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, in Acts, um, talking about. Uh, him being the leader, the pioneer, the author of our salvation. In Acts 5.31 it reads, Jesus is the one whom God raised to be his right side, to be on his right side as leader, prince, ruler, or savior. Through him, the people of Yashael could change their hearts and um, change their hearts and lives, repent and have their sins forgiven. So he is the way to salvation. Um, here we are talking about the author, the uh, the redeemer, the savior. <clears throat> but um, we do not want to um, in Hebrews one twelve, and uh, in Acts three fifteen it says, and so you kill the one who gives 
the author, the sourcer, the source, the ruler of life, uh, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses to this. This is the apostle speaking. So the idea of leading the way has passed into that of origination, the originator, the author. And in the present sense, uh, the, the author is, uh, uh, captures this whole idea that he is the author, he is the way, he, it is through him, and he, he authored um, salvation through his death. Uh, it's, uh, as, uh, and uh, in that he took on um, unto himself the conditions of man's lot, and so passing into glory which he wins for man through death. Uh, however, the idea of leading must not be entirely set aside, because in doing this he was like pulling us like with cart strings. Uh, to salvation where he was going, eternity. Um, he <clears throat> must not be uh, played down or minimized. He led man into salvation, being a man himself who died for our sins. We died with him and were resurrected in and with him. So he clearly led the way, authoring salva salvation. However, salvation remains a provision for each and every one desirous of it. Uh, and it means that you must be willing and uh, willing and be purposeful and to appropriate to appropriate this salvation in the name of Yeshaya. It is as the author of salvation that he is made perfect through suffering. Three aspects of uh, this truth are presented um, in our. In our readings of the of the Bible, in particular uh, the uh, the Hebrews thing, uh, Hebrews uh, uh, book. So by his suffering into death, he bore the sins of many. Uh, through suff suffering, showed them um, by his example that their way lay through suffering to glory, and in that spirit they must suffer learned as men to sympathize as and he learned as men to sympathize with and succor the support and succor and support them in their suffering. So this suffering was necessary for him to bring him closer to appreciate, to empathize, to fully understand what it is to be hum human and to understand the difficulties uh, of all these temptations and uh, because he was t tempted like men but he did not succumb. He, over, he overcame. In Hebrews 2.9 it reads, uh, But you see Jesus, who for a short time was made lower than the angels, uh, this was so that by God's grace he could die for everyone. And now because he suffered and died, he is wearing a crown um, of glory and honor. Um, yeah, he's wearing a crown of glory and honor. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, it reads, For this reason Jesus had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every way, so he could be their um, merciful and faithful high priest in service uh, to God. Then Christ Jesus would die in their place and take away um, their sins. And now... He can help those who are tempted or tested because he himself suffered and was tempted or was tested or and passed the test. Hebrews 4, chapter 4, verses 5 um, to 16, it reads, Therefore, since we have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, who has gone into, ascended into and passed through heaven or the heavens, uh, left us, let us hold on firmly to the faith we have, uh, the confession of our faith. For our high priest is able, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand. He understands us. He understands our weaknesses. He was tempted, tempted in every way that we are, but he did not sin. It is So therefore, in this case, he is the author of our salvation. Uh, and finisher of our faith he is the author and finishers of our faith um, perfect through suffering 
see, our Lord Jesus alone could say with full meaning, I am a human being, because he understood, he became man, and he understood everything that we we suffer. The, he saw everything. He experienced, he, he experienced what it was to be a man. Um, he, who appeared to be, was was who he essentially was, he was man. He alone achieved a completely integrated, real self, um, a perfect man, completely integrated person. He understood man, he became man. Um, in Ephesians 4, through 13 it reads, this work must continue until we are all joined together in the same faith and in the same knowledge of the Son of God. We must become like a mature person or the perfect man, growing until we become like Christ and have his perfection um, uh, to the glory, uh, to the measure of the stature of Christ's fullness. So he is our role model. Um, but he had to work on this. Hebrews always speaks of him as perfected. Um, for it was an act worthy, this is Hebrews 2.10, again, it was an act worthy and fitting uh, that he, for whose sake and by whom all things have their existence, in bringing many sons into glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect, uh, should bring to maturity the human experience necessary to be perfectly equipped uh, for his office as high priest through suffering. So to, for it had a perfecting effect that he understood what it was uh, to be human and therefore made him a perfect intercessor for us uh, to be a high priest. Um, in Romans 8.29 it reads, God knew them before he made the world. For those whom he foreknew and chose them, he chose them to be like molded to the pattern of conform to the image of his son so that Jesus will be the firstborn, the preeminent one, but also indicating others will follow of many brothers and sisters. Um, so this was the, that, that was a great plan. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 6, 4 it reads, but in every way uh, we show we are servants of God in accepting many hard Things as he suffered uh, in with great endurance and in troubles, trials, tribulations, and difficulties, hardships, and times of need, and the great and in great problems. This is part of being Christian that we accept being servants of God, going and have to go through all these, accepting all these hard things. In two Thessalonians three five, it reads, "May the Lord uh, lead, guide, direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's." patience, endurance, and perseverance, because he had to, he exercised a lot of patience and endured a lot uh, as he suffered for us to bring us this much needed um, um, salvation, which we must take hold of. In Hebrews 12, 1, it reads, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cr cr uh, cloud of people whose lives tell us that faith, what faith means, let us run the race that is before us and never give up with endurance and perseverance. We should remove from our lives, or get rid of, cast aside everything that would get in the way that impedes, hinders us, and the sin that so easily holds us back, entangles us, clings to us, ensnares us. Hebrews 5, 9 reads, But because his obedience was perfect, or having achieved perfection, he was able to to give to become the source means of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So we know that in dying, Christ was obedient. He was obedient, and if we are also obedient, we will have. Um, he becomes that source. We 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 grab that source of eternal salvation. That's um, salvation itself. Um, which comes with, uh, as I su suggested, that um, we 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 um, 
we go with him into salvation. We are resurrected with him into salvation. Hebrews 7.28, the Lord chooses, designates, appoints high priests who are, who are people with weaknesses. But the word of God's oath came later than the law. It made God's son to be the high priest, and that son has been made perfect forever. Uh, and this uh, example, this simple fact, sets him up as our pattern whom the Father seeks, seeks likewise to perfect. So we also want to, also want to perfect us as he perfected his sons. And his son, Yeshaya, is our role model. As he suffered, we suffer. Uh, we have to endure. Uh, that is the test. Uh, of course, we don't save anyone, but uh, we, we share in his suffering because we are in him. Yet the path of the Lord had to take, had to take um, this, uh, this hard uh, road. Yet the path the Lord, the Lord had to take to achieve this was hard indeed. His final point of perfection was reached at the moment of his death. The suffering of death uh, elicited within him that final point of completion, perfection, which was why he died at just that moment. Uh, having the preeminency of all angels and men above over all creation, he was perfected. The consecrating and accomplishing of a person for office by sacrifice. So Christ is that man. In Luke 32, 13:32 reads, Jesus replied, "Go tell that fox." that I will keep on casting out demons and doing miracles and healing today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my destination. This is the perfection. Um, Jesus is, um, uh, that's, that's the uh, living, transpassionate translation. The expanded translation reads, and Jesus said to, the, to them, go tell that fox Herod, uh, today and tomorrow I am forcing, driving, casting demons out and healing people. Then on the third day, I will reach my goal. I will accomplish my purpose, finish my work, finish my work. Uh, the Amplified Translation reads, And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, that sly, cowardly man, listen carefully, I cast out demons and perform healings today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I reach my, my goal. Uh, the Contemporary Standard Bible reads, and he said to them, Go tell that fox, Look, I'm driving out demons and performing healing, healings today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will complete my work. So here we have uh, the other, I think it's the King James says, uh, I shall be perfected, which is this, um, basically talking about someone who sacrificed and uh, uh, and completed, uh, who sacrificed and has completed his mission uh, of his office by dying. And in John 19:30, it reads, "When Jesus tasted the vinegar, the, the sour wine, he said, it is finished, completely completed, accomplished.' Then he bowed his head and he died." Um, and uh, the contemporary trans English translation reads, after Jesus drank the wine, he said, everything is done. He bowed his head and he died. He accomplished his mission, his, his calling completely. He achieved what he was sent to do. He, so as I think Derek Prince puts it, it was completely complete and perfectly perfect. Um, it was completed, it was thorough, it was complete, it was perfect. Um, so he offered the sacrifice of, a perf of perfect obedience, and this is in Hebrews 5, 8, even though Jesus was the Son of God, uh, the Son with all the rights and privi privileges of an heir, he learned obedience by what he suffered. Through total obedience to God, Jesus achieved the glorified or perfected state God originally intended for human beings. I think this is the amplified uh, 
you know, it, it, the, the expanded translation. Yeah. So he achieved a glorified or perfected state God originally intended for human beings. Um, he was enabled to be a perfect representative of man, where Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. By his grace, he began faith in people and grace. Um, by his grace, he began faith in people. And grace and gift of his uh, spirit finishes our faith in salvation. Through that path, the, the Lord Jesus is the author of our salvation. In Colossians 1.18 it reads, He is the head of the body, which is the church. He is the beginning, the meaning, the source of the church, the creator of all things, and three, the beginning, imitator, and the end time resurrection. Um, he is the first one who was raised... Um, the firstborn from the dead, so all things Jesus has first place, supremacy. Um, so Christ's death take, took away our sins. He in, he, in respect of, um, of saving his people, his own, is the author, the purchaser, the perfecter of it uh, to them. He, by his suffering and death, merited salvation for them by his word, and spirit uh, by this by his word and spirit uh, fits them for it um, he's fitted out for that he was um, he was prepared for for such a time as that by his intercession he vanquished uh, all his op op opposers and he puts them finally in and if um, and he puts his brethren finally into the actual possession of it which is the uh, eternal life uh, in the glory in heaven. For so by dying on the cross, this was something that was not expected, um, and uh, so what seemed to Jewish incredible that God should die uh, die for men, um, that the Christ should die was him dying was actually they could not conceive the, he they just saw that Jesus uh, Yeshua had come to save them from the colonial yoke of the of the Romans um, and it would not involve any dying because in dying you according to them they were, how do you save us through your death they, he wanted them to vanquish the Romans so anyway so so what seemed to Jews incredible uh, that the Christ should die was actually ordained by the grace of God for thus to make suffering the path to his kingdom was worthy of God so the path to his kingdom is suffering for those uh, for whose glory and through whose power all things exist who as creator commands all agencies and who cannot but do that which will subserve his glory if the means at which men wondered were chosen by God. No one may doubt their supreme fitness for the end. In Deuteronomy uh, 32.4 reads, He is a rock that he does, um, what he does is perfect and his he is always all his ways are fair. He is faith he is a faithful God who does no wrong, who is right, righteous and fair and virtuous. So perfect uh, through suffering, perfected through suffering. That means that complete by means of suffering that is to render him wholly qualified for his work. He had to suffer for as part of his work because he, I think, yeah, because he took on our sins. Uh, it is actually a great burden and it, it comes with its suffering. Even in this life, even before we uh, suffer a second death, there is suffering inherent in sin. If the whole creation can groan under the burden of sin, what more human beings if you're sensitive to what is actually happening but anyway it's uh the suffering qualified him for the work that he was doing which is a redemptive work so that he should be a savior just uh, adapted to redeem men 
This does not mean that he was sinful before or was made holy by his suffering, nor that he was not in all respects and aspects in his totality essence a perfect man, uh, that he was not that before. But it means that by his suffering he was made wholly suited to be a savior of people and that therefore the fact of his being a suffering man was on the face of it or seemingly evidence that he was not the son of God. So when people saw him suffering the way he, he, he did, dying, being whipped and uh, scourged and uh, to, to a point of near death and hung on a tree, people just thought, um, that listen, this guy, what did he do that was so sinful? And as Isaiah 53, 4 puts it, but he took on both our suffering. So what he suffered is what I use is the totality of our suffering on him. Uh, he felt our pain for uh, the pain for us. He, was, he carried our sorrows and our sicknesses. That is the suffering that we are talking about here. He saw his suffering. We saw his suffering and thought God was punishing him. Uh, God had stricken him and afflicted him. Because that's how they thought that when things bad happen to you, I mean, this is the story of Job. Um, in this case, it's true, but not necessarily so always. That uh, the, when you suffer or something bad, something happens to you is because you have done something wrong. Uh, in this case, he had actually he was doing something right by taking, he was taking the burden of our sins and the suffering and the pain and uh, and the sorrows that come with, uh, that are attendant in sin and in, uh, are inbuilt in sin itself or upon himself. And uh, when people saw him suffering this like this, they just thought, no, God has forsaken him. So um, there was, however, a completeness of all which was necessary uh, to his character as a savior by the suffering which he endured. He, we were made morally better by, we are made morally better by afflictions. Yeah, if we receive them in the right manner, for we are sinful and need to be purified in the firm furnace of affliction. Christ was not made better, for he was before perfectly holy, but he was completely endowed for the work which he came to do by his sorrows, uh, which he took on our sins. And it does not mean here precisely that he was uh, exalted to heaven as a reward for his suffering. No, he was taking away suffering. Um, uh, he atoned for our sins, and that he was raised up to glory as a consequence of them, of the sins. He carried them away because he carried them away. Uh, he redeemed his thing. And uh, which is true, uh, but uh, it was, but it was rendered complete or fully qualified to be a savior by his sorrows. Thus, he was rendered complete in the sacrifice he made at great cost for his brethren. So yes, you are your brother's keeper, and uh, because of his suffering, he was able to sympathize with us because he suffered. He took on our sins uh, and to succor them in their and to succor us in his, in our temptation. Hebrews 2:18 says, "And now he can help those who are tempted or tested, because he himself suffered and was tempted, um, or was tested or or passed the test. Two, by his suffering and atonement was made for sin. He would have been." an imperfect savior if he had not died to make an atonement for transgression to render him complete as a savior. It was necessary that he should suffer and die and when he hung, hung on the cross in the agonies of death he could appropriately say it is finished, the work is complete, all has been done that could be required to be done and man may now have the assurance that he is a perfect savior perfect not only in moral character but perfect in his work and his condition in his condition as man um, three because of his suffering in all forms in all the forms that flesh is liable to make made him an example to all 
his people who, sh who shall pass through trials. They have become, they have before them a perfect model to show them how to bear affliction. Had this, this not occurred, he could not have been regarded as a complete and perfect savior. Um, that is um, the savior that we need in Hebrews 5, 8 to 9 reads, even, even though Jesus was the son of God, or, or a son with all the rights and privileges of an heir, he learned obedience by what he suffered through total obedience to God. Jesus achieved the glorified and perfected state of God's orig that orig God originally intended for human beings. And because his obedience was perfect, or having achieved perfection, he was able to give, become a source, a means of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And this is the role that everybody yeah, must follow, that um, you are expected to 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 take on your cross and bear it and um, run with it to its conclusion. So he became a perfect model of uh, how we should um, behave under uh, affliction. For it became him for whom are all things. This is said of no other but of God the Father, who delivered him to death, and who in the final cause, who is the final cause of all things in nature and in grace. All things being made for his pleasure and for his glory, and he is the efficient cause of all things, um, as follows by those who are all things, by, by whom are all things, the works of creation, providence, and grace. For it became him, uh, the, that is, the arrangement was perfect, that in redeeming many, that the great agent by whom it was accomplished should be made complete in all respects by suffering. Um, Jesus was a man of sorrows, and uh, and that his end of days was a life of affliction. There was a reason for it, uh, a reason drawn from the plan and the character of God. It was fit in the nature of the case that he should be qualified to be a complete and perfect savior, a savior just adapted for the purpose undertaken by suffering, but much more the sacrifice sacrifice. The suffering, yes, but much more is the sacrifice, that which, which is that that which you hold dear, that which you cherish above all, you give it up in exchange for that which you want more or equally. The reason may be found in, uh, in the story of, um, of 2 Kings 3.27 where it says that then the king of Moab, Moab took his oldest son because he was uh, under great pressure. He was about to lose the city, the fortified city, to the um, his, um, Yasha allies. Um, he took his oldest son, who would have been king after him, and offered him, he sacrificed him as a burnt offering on the wall. So there was great anger against the Israelites, Yasha Israelites, who were alarmed at this, the Israelites left, went left and went back to their own land. So this is the power of sacrifice, how it can move and how it moves God. Uh, the, the bigger the sacrifice, um, the better. That it it will it will it will, it will captivate God, and certain levels of sacrifice, and this is what happened here. Even the Yeshayas who had been told that they can take over anything, uh, when this man Moab sacrificed his son, they could not prevail against that city. So, 
So God, we know, sac- responds to sacrifice, and that's why he sacrificed his son. And we see the same story with Abraham. When he says, Abraham, go and sacrifice your own son, Isaac. And he said, oh, this is a great thing that you have done, but you don't have to sacrifice your son. I will do that. I will sacrifice my son. Um, so there is, uh, there is also in his nature an infinite you love, okay, you love sacrifice, but there's also in his nature an infinite benevolence as one who wished to provide a perfect system of redemption to, um, to subject his son to such suffering as should completely qualify him to be a savior for all people. So his plan was full of benevolence. He was, his will was that he who should redeem the suffering and the lost should partake of their nature, identify himself with them and share in their woes and the consequences of their sins. In view of this, uh, the sovereign, the supreme leader, made the perfect plan and program to provide a perfect scheme of salvation which involved the humiliation and death of his own son. The whole plan bears the mark of the infinite wisdom of its author, God, the Father. This was the plan. It was to bring many to heaven who should be regarded and treated, uh, who should be regarded and treated as his sons. It was not a plan to save a few, but to save many uh, to heaven. Hence, we learn no representation of the gospel should ever be made, which will leave the impression that only a few or or a small number of the whole race will be saved. There is no such representation in the Bible, and it should not be made. God intends uh, taking the whole race together to save a large part of the human family, few in ages. Uh, well, some people think that there are few in ages past, uh, but it is true that overall that many have been saved, are being saved. Few now, um, but there are to be there, there are to be brighter days on earth, and this is the period where we talk about the great harvest in Revelation, in Revelation, the uh, 144,000 and the many martyrs uh, that is going to happen. This great harvest that he talks about in the Bible, uh, the period is to arrive when the gospel shall spread over all lands, and during that time, long period. Um, innumerable millions will be brought under its saving power and be admitted to heaven. All exhibitions of the Bible, of the gospel are wrong, which represent it as narrow in its design, uh, narrow in its offer, and narrow in its result. It is, the result is tremendous. And uh, the, the great awakening that we, are, we which is, I think, in its infancy, embroic stage um, now is going to mushroom and engulf the whole world world. So his aim and purpose in all this was to bring many sons to glory, not to worldly glory, but to the heavenly glory, which which we are undeserving of. But nevertheless was long ago prepared for us, which up to now remained hid and is now being unveiled. How generous and benevolent uh, of our Father in giving this weighty, solid, durable, eternal gift, which we do not deserve, nor could ever earn, even in multiple lifetimes. We are the persons whom God predestined to adoption, regenerated uh, by His Spirit and by His rich, uh, rich grace, brings us brings us into His glorious kingdom as sons. We who believe in Christ and have the spirit of adoption, and so being children are heirs of glory and are many. We are many. That God has ordained an eternal life and given to Christ and for whom, and given to Christ and for whom he has given himself a ransom and uh, whom he justifies. He has chosen us to hit this glory and prepared um, rooms for us. Um, in in his kingdom um, in Galatians now this is talks about the numbers most people think that they are um, 
that the, the number of the redeemed or the saved is far fewer than those who are uh, condemned. I, I have had a revelation actually that the the proportion is actually two thirds two thirds overall from beginning to now throughout will be two thirds will be saved a third will be lost and I think this is also the picture that we get in uh, in Ezekiel so a third will be lost and I think we also have uh, this third also confirmed in uh, when the the um, Satan was cast out of heaven, that a uh, third of the stars fell. So I think a third is going to fall, two thirds are going to be saved. And in Galatians 4 27, it reads, it is, it is written, Rejoice, barren woman, you who have not given birth, break out with a shout, you who have not suffered labor pains, because the woman who has been deserted will have many, many more children than the woman who has a husband. That's the contemporary English uh, translation. Um, the, the source, which is Isaiah 54, 1, 6, reads, um, spread out, think big. This is from the message translation. Sing, barren woman who has never had a baby. Fill the air with song. You who have never experienced childbirth, you are ending up with far more children than all those childbearing women. God says so. Clear lots of ground for your, for your tents. Make your tents large, spread out. Think big. Use plenty of rope. Drive the tent pegs deep. You are, you are, doing, you are going to need lots of elbow rooms. That's because you need, you need, uh, you need to create more space. Uh, for your growing family. You are going to take over whole nations. You are going to resettle the abandoned cities. Don't be afraid. You are not going to be embarrassed. Don't hold back. You are not going to come up short. You, you forget all about the humiliations of your youth and the indignities of being a widow will fade from memory. For your maker is your bridegroom, his name, God of the angels, uh, armies, your Redeemer, is the Holy One of Israel, known as God of the whole earth. You were like an abandoned wife, devastated with grief, and God welcomed you back like a woman married, like a woman married young and then left, says the Lord. Um, so we are, there are more of us than those who are actually going to, to hell. In John 14, 2, 4, reads the road, Don't let this rattle you. You trust God. You trust God, don't you? Trust me. There is plenty of room for you in my Father's house. If that weren't so, would I have, would, would I have told you that I am on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get a room ready. I'll come back and get you so you can live where I live. And you already know the road I am taking. Psalm 18.30 reads, The way, the paths of God are without fault, blameless, perfect. The Lord's words, promises are pure, tested, flawless, proven, true. He is a shield to those who seek um, who seek protection, take refuge in him. So in Peter, 1 Peter, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 2 to 5 reads, God the Father planned long ago to, and chose you, chose you according to his foreknowledge by making you his holy people, which is the Spirit's work, or by the sanctifying, purifying work of the Spirit, or by setting you apart by means of the Spirit. God wanted you to obey Him and to make and to be made clean, sprinkled by the blood of the death of uh, Yeshaya. Um, in the um, and um, continues, grace and peace be you, uh, be yours more and more may it be multiplied to you. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
in God's great abundant mercy, he has caused us to be born again anew into a new hope because Yeshaya arose by means of the resurrection from the dead. Now we hope for the blessing of God. We hope, and now we hope for the blessings of God. Um, God, the, the blessings of God uh, has for His children these blessings, which cannot be destroyed or be spoiled, corrupted or or lose their beauty, are kept in heaven. God's power protects you through your faith until salvation is shown to you, or the coming of the salvation, which is ready to be revealed at the end of in the last time, in the in these times, in the end times, at this time. Uh, and so, as to bring them with us to that glorious state and condition for persons uh, and enjoyments in the heavenly Eden prepared for us. And on this we come to our point of our introspection and meditation. Revelation chapter 10 uh, verses 9 to 11 from the expanded translation and it reads so I went to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll and he said to me take the scroll and eat it a symbol of internalizing the word word it will be sour bitter in your stomach because it is a message of judgment but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey because it is God's word and because it brings salvation and vindication to his people um, on the question of sweetness, Psalm 119, uh, verse 103 reads, Your promises are sweet to me. How sweet your words slip, slide down my palate. Um, sweeter than honey in my mouth. Jeremiah, on the same point, uh, 15, verses 16 reads, Your words came to me, were found, and I listened carefully and ate them. Your words made me very happy and were the delight of my heart because I am called by your name, Lord God, all-powerful, almighty God. And then we continue with verse 10 and it reads, So I took the small scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. In my mouth it tasted sweet as honey, but after I ate it, it was sour, bitter in my stomach. Then I was told, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings, you must share the word you have just received from the last sentence from the, that's, um, that is verse 11, from the contemporary English version reads, Then some voices said, Come, now keep on telling what will happen to the people of many nations, races, and languages, and also to kings. So basically here, what is going to happen is that there's going to be a, a, a dis decision time. Uh, the consequences of our decisions will become clear and we will live them either uh, damnation or eternal life. And um, the way to eternity is through Yeshaya, uh, the belief of him and keeping his commandments and, um, and statutes and having uh, a relationship with him. And our benediction comes out of Numbers uh, 6, verses 22 to 27, again from the expanded translation, and it reads, uh, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you shall bless the Yashaelites, uh, the sons of Yashael. Say to them, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord guard you. May the Lord show you his kindness. Make his face shine upon you and have mercy on you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord watch over you, lift up his face, presence, countenance upon you, and give you peace. So Aaron and his sons will bless the Yashaelites with my name. Put my name upon the sons of Yashael, and I will bless them. And the last sentence from the common Jewish Bible reads, And in this way they are to put my name on the people of Yashael, so that I will bless them. And on this, um, thank you, and may God bless you all.